Hi everybody, it's Katie back with another episode of my vlog and back with another shibori tutorial. And today I want to show you how to make the Ori Nui style of binding, which is the one that gets you the fabric that looks like teeth that everyone seems to love so much. That's this pattern. Um, I've sold a lot of masks with this pattern on them for the obvious reason and I wanted to show you guys how to do this one. So I'm going to show you how to do this binding um, and how to get that with the blue background as well as how to get the teeth pattern with this white and blue background. So let's begin. All right, I've got my supplies all ready to go to do this Ori Nui binding. I'm using a piece of quilter's cotton like I normally do, but you can also do this on a t-shirt or any other type of cotton fabric. The first thing you need to do is establish the line that you're gonna follow with your stitching. I'm doing straight line stitching in this demo and I find the easiest way to do that is just to fold the fabric and then iron it to create a crease in the fabric and then I can just follow that crease. You can see I've got a number of creases in my fabric here because I want to be able to repeat the line of stitching all the way down the fabric. You can also use a washout marker or water soluble pencil to draw the line, um, but I find it very easy to just fold and iron that. Um, I do recommend if you want to use a water soluble pen, I like this guy, Leone's. This is my favorite uh, washout marker. I've tried a whole bunch of them. That's the best. Um, but like I said, you don't need a washout marker for this right now because I've just ironed pleats into the fabric. Um, you're going to need that strong thread. Again, I use heavy duty upholstery thread. You're gonna need a needle with a pretty big eye. I like to use embroidery needles for this. They are pretty long and they have a nice big eye for that um, extra strong thread. It's extra thick also, so it's harder to uh, thread into a smaller eyed needle. The other tools that I have here are a leather thimble, which is important because I don't know if you guys can see the uh, surface damage on that thimble there, but that is not surface damage on my finger. So that's why I use a leather thimble. Um, I also find a leather thimble more comfortable than a um, metal thimble. So that's what I use. Um, I've got my scissors and I have a little roll of electrical tape. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to take this electrical tape and unwind a couple inches of it and double it back on itself to create a little Oh, I call them tape flags. I use them as little stoppers on the end of my thread. Now you can just tie a knot on the end of your thread if you don't want to do this, but I find it super easy to make these little stoppers and it makes it way easier on the other end when I have to take everything out. Um, this is super easy and cutting out the threads when they have tiny little knots is a little bit harder for me to do. So I'm all about making things easier for myself in the future. Um, <laughs> I've already threaded my needle. I have the um, length of thread through the needle and then both ends are the same length. And you'll notice that my complete doubled thread is longer than the width of my fabric because I need that extra working room. So I'm gonna go back here to the loose end of the threads and I'm gonna create a slip knot. You remember a slip knot is fold the thread over itself reach down through that loop, grab it, pull it up. There's your slip knot. Take the little tape flag, put it in the loop of the slip knot, and pull on the long end of the threads to secure that down and snug it into place. Now that guy is not going anywhere, and that's gonna be our little stopper for the end of the thread. Now, let's get ready to sew here. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna sew from right to left. If you're left-handed, you're gonna to wanna to go from left to right. I'll move some of these other guys out of the way so I've got some room and get my fabric ready here. It's actually a super long piece of fabric because I want to make a bunch of it because I got to make a bunch of masks. Um, but what you want to do is find that first fold line in your fabric and then go ahead and actually fold it up because the trick to this stitching is we're going to run the thread through both layers of fabric pretty close to the fold. We're going to create a long running stitch down the length of the fabric and then pull it tight to gather it. And that's what creates that cool teeth design in the fabric. So, whoops. Uh, you wear your thimble on your middle finger so that you can hold the needle in your first two fingers to control it and then push with that middle finger, okay? So I am going to start here. Like I said, on the right end of the fabric, I'm going to put that through 
to the other side through both layers of fabric. And then I'm not even gonna pull it all the way through and then turn it around. I'm just gonna rock it to the side and then push it back through to the front like that. It's way faster than pulling the needle through and pulling it back and pulling it through and pulling it back. So that's how I'm gonna do it. Um, pull this through, maybe pull half the slack of the thread through. You don't need all of it yet. Um, and then just continue taking stitches down the length of the fabric. I am going to push through, rock to the side, and then pull back. And my goal here is to create a running stitch, which is this dashed line, um, with stitches that are about half an inch long and about half an inch away from the edge of the fabric. It doesn't have to be exact. And in fact, I find with this binding, if you're a little less than exact with your spacing and your stitching, um, it actually looks kind of cooler. So that's actually a problem I have. I'm pretty exact with my spacing and it's hard for me to make things more um, random and sort of wonky, but I do like that kind of organic effect that you get from making your stitches a little less even. So if you take a look here, I've got a dashed line on the front and a dashed line on the back side of the fabric. Now I'm about to run out of slack thread here. So I'm gonna do like two more stitches and then we will pull some extra thread through here. Don't have a lot to work with now. So I'm gonna pull this thread through, but I don't want it to gather up on me. So I'm going to hold the corner of the fabric over here as I pull so that I'm just sliding the thread through the fabric and I'm not actually gathering the fabric up. We're gonna do that as the last step. So keep sewing along, make those stitches. If your thread starts to tangle, you can hold your project up in the air and let the thread dangle down so it can untangle. You're actually moving it in a circle when you sew in this straight line because you see how the, the thread is looped around into that circle shape, right? So I'm not actually going in a straight line with my motion, I'm actually turning in circles, which means every time I take a stitch, I'm putting a little twist in the thread. So the longer you make this line, the twistier your thread is going to get and the more likely to get tangled. But again, if you want to untangle it, you can just pick your work up and drop the needle and it will untangle all by itself with the help of gravity. Ooh, close to the edge on that last one. But I think I'm okay. I'm still a few threads away from the edge there. Um, so like I was saying, if you want to let the twist out of your thread, you just pick your work up. It's kind of hard to see from the angle that I'm recording at, but you just let it kind of hang in the air there and it'll sort of spin the excess out of there. But I don't need to do that because look at that, I'm done with my line of stitching. So next thing, we're going to cut the end of the thread and release the needle so that we can do another line of stitching. Now I'm not gonna demo doing all the lines of stitching all the way down this thing, but um, what you wanna do, of course, is you want to complete one line of stitching. Again, you can see I've got front and back visible with that dashed line and it's going right near the edge of the fold there. So now I actually can't lay this flat on the table, but I've got my nice little prepared line of stitching. Um, so then the next step would be to do another line of stitching and 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 keep going all the way down the fabric until the whole thing is stitched before you start gathering anything together. Now, because I finally figured out I can do this like a cooking show, I already made one that's totally ready to go. So. Here is my piece, which has all of its lines of stitching done on it. So now the next step is we want to gather our stitches. And this part is really fun. You want to pull on the loose end, the left end of the thread. And as you pull, you can push the fabric along and it should just kind of zip up into neat little pleats, just like that. If it has a little trouble, if the pleats don't go the right way, you can manipulate them with your fingers Oh, see that's trying to twist. This pleat is trying to head the wrong direction, so I'm gonna fix it. You don't wanna make a mess with this, you want it to be pretty neat. So you're gonna zip it up. Ooh, it's so satisfying to do. And then I'm sure you guys can guess that that is what's gonna create that cool teeth pattern in the fabric. So you wanna Pull that tight, move to your next line of stitching, which is now distorted. And you can see why you wanna do all of your straight lines of stitching before you start gathering any of the um, lines up 
because it's going to be really hard to do a straight line of stitching when it's that distorted by the previous line. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this one and I'm just going to pull on that and get those pleats to line up on the fabric. I'm realizing I probably should have turned this whole thing around and done this on the right side, but I didn't, but that's okay. We're all learning as we go, right? You guys are learning how to do shibori and I'm learning how to do tutorials. I think every one gets better than the last one because I am learning from my mistakes early on. So you don't want the thread to be caught in the fabric. You want a nice little line of pleats showing on each one of these gathers, okay? And now, now I have these long threads, which are kind of a pain in the butt, but we're gonna cut them off in a minute. But first I gotta finish doing the gathers. So take this next one. Let's see if we can get that nice and gathered up. Oh, this one's not behaving as well as the other one did. Some, you know, sometimes it goes really easy and just sort of slides into place. Other times you gotta give it a little bit more help. Kind of like life, right? Sometimes things just flow really easily and other times you gotta push it or prod it or fold it or give it a little extra boost to make sure that it's just going the way you want it to. There we go, there's another nice little line of pleats. And again, this doesn't have to be perfect and I think it actually looks better if it's not perfect. I mean, I reject the concept of perfect. There is no such thing as perfection, right? Let's do another line. Oh, there's a funny drug joke in there somewhere, but I'm not gonna make it. I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> oh, it's getting harder to do as I go down the length of this, because again, like I said, the more distorted pieces down here are sort of trapping some, some gathers in the fabric here. Oh, come on, get those pleats lined up. All right, there we go. Sort of pulled, pulled apart from each other and lined up there. Oh, three more lines of stitching together. I kind of went overboard on these samples, but um, like I said, you guys are buying so many masks for me. Thank you to everyone who has bought a mask. Um, I have actually used up my entire back stock of Shibori dyed fabric with the exception of the like three sample pieces that I saved for this video and I'm gonna cut them up like as soon as I stop recording so I can make more masks out of them. Um, I'm super excited to do another dye session in a couple days here, not only to make some more fabric for myself uh, so that I can make more masks, but also I realized I um, looked in my studio notes and it's been over two years since I did a dye day, um, which is crazy, but I mean, if you think about it, it's been 20 months since Sean had a stroke and I haven't had a lot of time to do things like a huge production dye day. Um, so I'm really excited about that and we're going to record the whole thing. Henry said he's going to run camera for me. Um, so hopefully I'm going to get some successful video from that and be able to do a whole dye tutorial as well, which I am so excited to share with you guys. Um, dyeing is one of my favorite things to do. Ha ha ha, boy, you better believe there's a lot of dying jokes around here. Um, but it really is, I just love it so much and I love the results I get and I'm super excited to show that to you guys. Oof, last line, let's do it, zip it up. This one actually should be easier because it doesn't have another line of stitching following it to distort it, but who knows? I'm trying to curl up on itself in some weird way. All right. There we go. And then again, you know, adjust your pleats, figure out if there's something that's kind of sitting not facing the right way that's making it not be the way you want it to be. And that is how we want to have that look. Now, the next thing we have to do is we've got to tie off all of these threads because if I just was to put this in the die like this, of course, this would just loosen itself up and come apart in the dye bath. Um, so what I do to end the line of sewing, very similar to the way we began the line of sewing, is I'm going to use one of those little tape flags. Um, I pre-made a couple of them, so I have one right here ready to go. And basically using the same idea, but instead of tying a slip knot on this end, because I won't be able to get it tight enough, 
I'm just going to tie a square knot. You guys know how to do a square knot, right? It's the left over right, right over left guy, or I guess right over left, left over right, either one. I'm just going to cut my threads a little bit so I've got a shorter thing to work with. And hopefully you can see here, this is also where having two threads comes in handy. I do two threads so that I don't accidentally break them by pulling on them too hard, but also because it makes it incredibly easy to do this finish. You just open the two threads up, lay the little tape flag right in between them, and then tie your knot. We'll go right over left and snug it down. And that stopper makes it so it doesn't go anywhere. Then you want to complete the knot by going left over right. That's what makes the square knot. And that's nice and secure. So your final bound little piece should look like that with your two little stoppers on each side. Now the stoppers are going to block a little bit of dye there, but it's right at the edge of the fabric and I don't really care that that's going to look like that. It's not going to matter to me. Um, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to tie another little tape flag like this at the end of each one of these um, lines of stitching that I've gathered together. But I did want to show you guys one other thing. Um, you probably have figured out by now that these sort of loose spaces in between the lines of pleating are going to catch a lot of dye when they go into the dye bath. And that will produce a finished piece of fabric that looks something like this, where you have your line of stitching, but then the parts that are away from the line of stitching saw a lot of dye in the bath, and so they turned blue. If you want that to be lighter colored, like this piece, I'll turn it around so you can see it correctly, what you have to do, of course, is bind up these parts of the fabric so that they don't see as much dye. So with this piece, what I did was after I pulled all of my um, stitched lines tight and I tied them off at the ends, I then gathered the piece together and I went down the length of the whole thing, just spiral wrapped it with another piece of thread. In fact, you can see right here, there's the lines from the thread wrapping around the bound section that was on this piece. Makes sense? So that's it. I could, uh, I could bind every other one so that I have a cool piece of fabric where there's a white section and then a dark blue section and then a white section and then a dark blue section. Of course, you can see and imagine how those pleats there are going to translate into this blue line and then these little lines that make this sort of teeth design on the fabric. Now the other cool thing that you can do with this design, which is kind of maybe advanced level, is you can do a line that's not straight. So on this piece, what I did was I used my washout marker that I showed you earlier. I traced a wavy line instead of having a straight line on my fabric. And then what I had to do was as I was sewing it, I pinched that line and made the fold. So this is a little bit harder because to get a curved fold, you have to do kind of a lot of time manipulating the fabric into that shape, but you can do it. It's, it's not that much harder to do. I do recommend uh, trying the straight line version first, uh, just because it is that much easier, but this is not that hard at all. And actually, I think I did the curved version first and then moved to the straight line ones. So. Um, that's it. That's how you do this Ori Nui uh, teeth style shibori binding. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that tutorial and learned a little something today. Tune in in a few days for the Cinema Club Sunday Roundup. And next week on Friday, I am going to bring you the indigo dyeing tutorial, which I am super excited to make. So take care until then. And thanks for watching.